Okay. Right. Next week's presentation. It is only by leaving your home that you find it. Presented by David Ellison. Now, David gave us a talk uh, several weeks ago. I got so carried away, I don't think he even got halfway through his talk. Um, he had a lot more to say, and he's going to finish that uh, fascinating talk next week. So, retired history teacher and raconteur, Dave Ellison, will continue to share what he's been discovering while researching his upcoming book, Niños Eros, the fascinating stories behind Mexican street names. This time, Dave will focus on the convoluted story of the Mexican War for Independence and its tortuous aftermath, comparing it to the United States Revolution. By studying Mexico's history, Dave explains, I've finally begun to understand and appreciate my own. Want to learn the stories behind so many Ajijic streets such as Castellanos, Guadalupe Victoria, Insurgentes, Matamoros, Galeano, Hidalgo, Morelos and Guerrero? Come listen to Dave's engaging walk through Mexico's history and come home again to yours. Uh, David Ellison recently retired after 36 years in education. He was a teacher, history was his favorite subject, mentor teacher, school administrator, education columnist, and community activist. He was honored as the New Haven Unified and American Council of School Administrators, Region 6, Teacher of the Year in 1996. I don't think that the, the first half was just fascinating, and we're all dying to know about the, uh, the street names and the stories behind them. So that's the part he's gonna cover next week. So don't miss that, it'd be great. Now for this week's presentation, Shakespeare and Ferma, two fascinating enigmas to ponder, brought to us by Michael Warren. Michael will, will intrigue us with two enigmas from the 17th century. First, he will dedicate, discuss the dedication of Shakespeare's sonnets, published in 1609. And second, he will discuss Fermat's Last Theorem, a mathematical puzzle of historical importance, first set out by Pierre Fermat in 1637. Michael Warren is a poet, actor, and mathematician. For the last several years, he has been writing the theater reviews for the Ojo del Lago. Please give a warm and safely distant welcome to Michael Warren. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. So, good morning. Today I'm going to talk about um, two enigmas or mysteries from the 17th century. And we'll start with uh, Shakespeare's sonnets. And the mystery concerns the um, dedication page, which I'll read to you. To the only begetter of these ensuing sonnets, Mr. W.H., all happiness and that eternity promised by our ever-living poet wishes the well-wishing adventurer in setting forth T.T. Now, T.T is Thomas Thorpe, the publisher, and that's generally acknowledged. So the dedication was not written by Shakespeare, it was written by the publisher. So the mystery concerns who is Mr. W.H.? And actually, there's another kind of ambiguity. He says, to the only begetter. Now, begetter could mean, you know, the one who wrote the sonnets, or it could mean the one that gave me the, the manuscript that I got the, the sonnets from. So, um, and as, as uh, was said before, the sonnets were published in, in 1609 by Thomas Thorpe. But they were actually written in 1593, which is quite a long time earlier. And most scholars agree that they were not written for publication. I mean, there's this long time lapse between 1593 and 1609. Um, and actually, in 1593, there were a number of things that indicate that they were written in that year. For one thing, there was a plague 
an outbreak of the plague and the theatres were closed. 1593, 1594, I guess we all know what that's like. And um, there were some other indications about the year. There's some references in the sonnets themselves to some events. For example, there was the disgrace of Sir Walter Raleigh, which was in 1592. What Raleigh had done, actually, was he, he got married secretly to one of the Queen's ladies-in-waiting without asking the Queen, and she was very upset. So she locked him up in the tower for a while. Um, he did eventually get out, but uh, he was disgraced. Also, there's a reference to the death of Christopher Marlowe, who was about the same age as Shakespeare and very talented. And Shakespeare refers to him as a rival poet with, with great respect. Now, Marlowe was stabbed to death in an in a, in a alehouse, in a pub, near the docks in 1593. And um, there's a sonnet that kind of refers to that in the past tense and never refers to it again. If you actually read the sonnets, they, they're all addressed to a young man. Well, not all. The first 126 are addressed to a young man. Um, and it's pretty clear that Shakespeare's relationship to this, this individual was not exactly passionate, but he owes him a lot, and he also uses the word love quite frequently. And uh, in one sonnet, he refers to this young man as the master mistress of my passion, which uh, is quite strong language. S some people have thought, because of that, that um, Shakespeare's relationship with this young man must have been homosexual. But actually, Shakespeare himself uh, gives the lie to that. He, um, he actually is fairly explicit. He says, A woman's face with nature's own hand painted hast thou the master mistress of my passion. A woman's gentle heart but not acquainted with shifting change as is false women's fashion. An eye more bright than theirs, less false in rolling, gilding the object whereupon it gazes. A man in hue, all hues in his controlling, which steals men's eyes and women's souls amazes. And for a woman wert thou first created, till nature, as she wrought thee, fell a doting, and by addition me of thee defeated, by adding one thing to my purpose, nothing. But since she pricked thee out for women's pleasure, mine be thy love and thy love's use, their treasure. It's fairly explicit. So what he's saying is, if you were a woman, I could love you better, but since you're not, you'll have to make love to women and I'll just have to love you in a more platonic fashion. That's what he's basically saying. So who is this person that the sonnets are addressed to? Well, the early sonnets all say how good-looking this young man is, and he should get married because life is short and you should have children. You'll need to have an heir. Now, Shakespeare's patron was the Earl of Southampton, who was very rich, very young, and very good-looking. In 1593, Shakespeare was... 29, and Southampton was 20. So it all fits together. It's, it's fairly clear that, um, in fact, it's very clear that the sonnets were addressed privately to Southampton, the Earl of Southampton. Of course, not all the scholars agree. There's been quite a few suggestions, like that Mr. W.H. was William Holm or the actual Earl of Southampton himself, 
William Herbert, there's many others, including a man called William Hall, who had the job of uh, finding manuscripts for Thomas Thorpe. But those, those suggestions don't really fit in the way that Southampton fits. And if you read the sonnets, it's very clear that they're very private. They're sent to Southampton for his, uh, for his entertainment, really, and as a duty as well. Um, now, I'm, I'm indebted for the, uh, the uh, idea that I'll present to you to the, the Shakespearean scholar called A.L. Rouse, who wrote this book. He was very brilliant. He was an English scholar who was born in, quite, in poverty. His parents were quite poor in Cornwall. Uh, but he was so brilliant, he, he got a scholarship to Oxford and later became a professor of, of English literature, specializing in the Elizabethan period. Now, according to Rouse, and I think this, this is very plausible, um, the manuscript, the sonnets that had been sent to Southampton, um, were sat, sitting in the family home for, I guess, nearly 15 years. Now, Southampton's mother, the Countess of Southampton, was actually married three times because in those days your husband might die and life was short. So people who lived to age 55 or 60 were quite often married more than once. Her second husband died in 1597. And in 1598 she married a man called Sir William Harvey. She herself died in 1607 and left all her household goods and chattels to her husband, Harvey. So the manuscript was passed by Sir William Harvey, Mr. W.H., to Thomas Thorpe for publication. Now, A.L. Rouse was very clever, but he was not very popular. He was extremely arrogant and quite rude to people who didn't agree with him. Um, he actually died, I think, in 1997. Uh, he, was, he was quite old. He reached the age of 93. To this day, no one can agree. I guess the scholars didn't like Rouse very much, and this plausible explanation isn't generally accepted by them. So no one has actually agreed as to the identity of Mr. W.H., but I, I do think that the explanation I've just given is very plausible. I should mention there's a lady called Brenda James. Uh, she's a writer, an author, um, and a historian. She came up with the idea that this whole um, uh, dedication page was really written in code. So she had this uh, idea that it was a secret code and, you know, it doesn't really mean what it says. Um, she took the letters of the dedication page and kind of rearranged them in a magic square and um, manipulated the magic square two or three times. It's quite complicated and came up with the idea that there was a, a man called Sir Henry Neville, who did live at that time, but he's not actually known for having published or written anything. She wrote this book called The Truth Will Out. Um, on, it's very clever, but I, I, don't think my, I don't think it's plausible. So that's the explanation which I put forward to you, um, no one, I guess, will ever agree. So I think we can say that this, this uh, mystery or enigma may not be solved, although I think Rouse solved it.
I'll end up with Shakespeare's words himself, because we do have the sonnets. So long as men can breathe, or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. The sonnets themselves are, are very revealing if you take the trouble to, to read them in the order that they're published. They kind of document Shakespeare's uh, feelings, emotions, um, sometimes criticisms of uh, Southampton and his fears that this rival poet, who I, I think is Marlowe, um, will supersede him in, in Southampton's eyes. Um, there's a lot of personal information in there. It's, it's like an autobiography. The first 126 sonnets are all written to Southampton. Yeah, the, the last, well there's 154 in total, so the last 28 are all about his passionate love affair with the, the dark lady and actually she jilts him in the end, which makes him extremely upset. I'll pass on to the, uh, the mathematical puzzle, Fermat's Enigma. Now, you have to realize that at that time, at the beginning of the 17th century, Pierre, Pierre Fermat was born in 1607. Mathematics was really kind of a subject for amateurs. Europe was emerging from what we call the Dark Ages. Um, because, I guess mainly because most of the ancient knowledge from Greece and Rome had been lost, or at least lost to Europe. There was still a lot of knowledge in India and in Baghdad and so on, but not known to the Europeans. All that ancient knowledge was destroyed when the library of Alexandria was destroyed. They had kept, you know, thousands of scrolls of knowledge and information. It was a classical library. Um, it was actually destroyed by um, a couple of religious um, maniacs, really. The Christian Emperor Theodosius in AD 389 decided that, that this was pagan knowledge and should be destroyed. And then later the, um, the uh, Islam Caliph Omar finished, finished the job in AD 642. Um, I think he said that anything that was not in the Quran was superfluous and should be destroyed, and if it was in the Quran, it was already known. So, for either reason, it, the, the knowledge was lost. So, at that time, Europe was just emerging I mean, this knowledge eventually filtered back after about a thousand years. Um, there, were no, there were no university courses in, in mathematics. I think there was a course in geometry at Oxford, but that was it. Um, Galileo, who incidentally was born the same year as Shakespeare, um, had to get a private tutor to learn mathematics because there was no course. He was a student at the university in Pisa. So Pierre Fermat, he was actually a lawyer. He, uh, he became a judge eventually. He lived in southwest France. He was born in 1607 and he died in 1665. Uh, he used to correspond with sort of amateur mathematicians saying, I just solved this, can you solve it? He would like to challenge people. He, he never bothered to write out any proof. It was, it was more like a game. But he was always right. Um, 
he was he was brilliant in many ways. He he had um, just this talent for understanding numbers. By the way, there's something universal uh, about number theory, if you've ever thought about it. Um, if there was an intelligent being somewhere else in the universe, or a group of aliens, their mathematics would be the same as ours, because they would have to count. And that's really all it is, one, two, three, etc. So Fermat liked to play with numbers. He actually did a number of other things. He, he invented probability theory along with uh, uh, Pascal, who he corresponded with. And he, he did some work on what later became calculus, which was invented by Isaac Newton. Um, so he wasn't just occupied with numbers, but he, he was a, a genius in many ways. Um, for example, I'll give you this crazy example. There's a number 26 that's stuck between 25 and 27. The 25 is a, is a perfect square, it's 5 times 5. And 27 is a perfect cube, it's 3 times 3 times 3. And he said, there's no other such number, just like that. Can you prove it? He never bothered to write down his proof, but he just challenged his, his friends and correspondents. And it turns out it's extremely difficult to prove, but it, what he said was true. So he liked to play with numbers. So here we are in, I guess, 1637 or thereabouts, and Fermat obtained a copy in Latin, as it happens, of an early Greek mathematical treatise by a man called Diophantus. And it was published in France in 1621. So here he is looking, looking at Pythagoras. Everybody familiar with Pythagoras? Remember Pythagoras from school? It's the right angled triangle. A squared plus B squared is C squared, where C is the long side opposite the right angle. So Fermat, looking at this, Pythagoras, by the way, proved that in about 500 BC. So it's been around for a long time, but not generally known in Europe. And he thinks to himself, what would happen if I changed it from, you know, squares to cubes or higher powers, like a cubed plus b cubed equals c cubed or something. Could that happen? And he, he scribbles a note in the margin, it's quite a wide margin actually, saying, there's no solution for higher powers in whole numbers. No solution. He said, I, I have a wonderful proof of this, but this margin is too small to contain. And then, of course, he never wrote it down. And then later on in 1665, he, he died. So we don't know if he had a proof or not. And in fact, nobody was sure whether what he said was correct or not. How do we know this? Well, we know because actually his son, Clément published all his father's notes, which was uh, a wonderful thing, otherwise we would have no idea what, what Fermat had scribbled down. And over the following centuries, people have struggled to prove there were, there were other things that Fermat had scribbled down, struggled to prove what he said. And he was always proved correct. I don't think any of his uh, ideas were proved incorrect. But nobody could prove this one, which is why it's called Fermat's Last Theorem. People have struggled with it for over 350 years. Uh, it actually shouldn't be called a theorem. It should be called Fermat's Last Conjecture, because 
we don't know if it's true or not. About a hundred years later, there was a famous mathematician called uh, Leonhard Euler, or Euler, I'm not sure if I pronounced that correct, managed to prove that Fermat was correct for powers three and four. And then later on, uh, I think there was a woman, Sophie Germain, uh, it, was, it was established that you need only prove it for the prime numbers, which is, I guess, some help, but not a great help, because there's an infinite number of prime numbers. Do you know what a prime number is? Should I explain? Anyone want me to explain? <laughs> Perhaps you know. Um, prime numbers are the numbers that are only divisible by one. They have no other divisors, like three, five, 11, 13, and so on. There's actually no end. There's an infinite number of prime numbers. So it kind of got narrowed down, but uh, still people were not sure if it was true or not, or might be true but unprovable. That was another possibility. In 1847, the French Academy of Science offered a gold medal and a special prize for a general solution to Fermat's last theorem. And there were two mathematicians, Lame and Cauchy, said they were just on the brink. They put their work so far in sealed envelopes, so it would be, you know, they could get priority. Um, but, however, there was a man called uh, Kummer, Ernst Kummer, who was actually in Berlin, he wrecked everything because he knew that the method they were using and he pointed out a fundamental flaw in their method. So in the end they, they had to withdraw and, and the medal was awarded to Kummer himself. But all he had managed to prove was that there was something wrong with their method. He actually had never been able to prove what Fermat had indicated. I should also tell you the story of a man called Paul Wolfscale, the German industrialist. When he was a young man, he fell in love with a beautiful lady, and I assume she was beautiful, who rejected him. And he was so upset, life was no longer worth living. He decided to kill himself. But being very organized, he didn't just kill himself. He set a time, midnight on a certain day, he would, he would shoot himself. And in the meantime, he would put all his affairs in order. Well, it came to about 9 p.m. and he'd, he'd already finished putting his affairs in order, but he had said midnight. So, um, he was an amateur mathematician. He wasn't a, a very good mathematician, but he liked to play with numbers. And he, he was familiar with, uh, I guess he had a book about uh, the interplay with Kummer and this prize which wasn't award, well, was awarded to Kummer in 1847. This was, a, I guess, about 1880 by then. And he had a, an idea that he started kind of passing the time by looking at it, and he, he thought he discovered a flaw in Kummer's proof. So he thought, oh, I can fix this. He said, I'll become famous. And he started on it, and of course, it, it took him most of the night, and he forgot to kill himself. <laughs> so he actually lived quite a long, successful life. He had been, oh, by the way, he, he, he discovered that Kuma was correct. But um, when he died eventually, I think it was about 1907, in his will, he left what was called the Wolfscale Prize, which was about 300,000 Deutschmarks, which at that time was worth at least a million dollars for anyone who could prove Fermat's theorem, Fermat's conjecture. He didn't actually award any money to anyone who could disprove it, but anyway, 
the prize was for being able to prove it. And he, um, he gave the job in his will, he appointed as trustees the um, University of Göttingen, which was a, a huge task the university was obliged to take on um, because they kept getting false proofs. People wanted to win the prize. And um, I think in the Guinness Book of World Records, the, the, the largest number of false proofs ever submitted is, is exactly those for the people who tried to prove Fermat's last theorem. In fact, the university had to kind of pre-print a, a notice saying, you know, thank you for submitting your, your uh, attempt to prove Fermat's last theorem. The first error is on page and then you fill in the page. But they did receive a lot of people trying to prove it. So in the 20th century, most people had, uh, had actually given up. They, they thought it might be true, but unprovable. And it wasn't worth the effort, because you, know, you might spend years wasting your time, and you, know, you could be doing something more useful. Now there's a man called Andrew Wiles, an Englishman. He's still alive. Uh, he was born in 1953. When he actually grew up in Cambridge, England, and he was quite a bright boy. I mean, he, he was good at math, among other things. And in his little local library, he found a book of, of puzzles and you know, mathematical considerations or things that could be proved or not. And he came across the, this Fermat theory. He thought, well, I'm 10 years old, and I probably know about as much math now as Fermat did then, which is probably true. So he thought, I, I can prove this. Anyway, he failed, but he, he never forgot that there was this theorem that you know, would dominate his life. He was very talented. He got a PhD at Oxford later. Then he moved to Princeton in the United States. Um, I can't possibly describe to you uh, the math that's involved. I don't even understand it myself. So, but I, I, I just can give you an overview. In 1986, it came to his attention that some other mathematicians had said, if you can prove there's another conjecture. If you can prove this other conjecture, then Fermat will also be proved. So there was a connection. And he thought, ah, oh, this is something I could try. But he decided to do it secretly. He didn't tell anyone. This went on for seven years. He was inventing all kinds of ingenious you know, side proofs, things that needed to be proved along the way. He actually invented a, lo a lot of methods that nobody had thought of before. And this went on for seven years. Can you imagine the concentration? He thought of nothing else. Um, from time to time, he would release some other document, which he actually he'd done before, just to fool people so they'd think he was working on something, when actually he was secretly working on, on this attempt to prove uh, Fermat. In 1993, after seven years of concentrated work, and this is very unusual, most mathematicians, you know, consult each other, get feedback, bounce ideas off each other, and so on. Working by himself is very unusual, but he did. I guess he enjoyed working that way, and he wanted to, to be the one the one who had proved it. So along the way, he proved some actually very interesting math. But, um, in 1993, after seven years of working secretly, he gave a series of lectures um, in England. It was in Cambridge. And uh, supposedly ended up by proving this other conjecture, which then 
automatically proves firmer. And so he kind of stood aside and shyly said, I think I'll just stop here. Well, of course, a thing like that doesn't just automatically get agreed. They have referees who have to study it and make sure it works and make sure there are no mistakes and so on. And there was quite a drama because one of the referees discovered a place in, in Wilde's reasoning that didn't quite work. And at first he, he thought, well, this is something I can clear up, but he couldn't. I mean, this went on for a year, which was torment because he'd never previously told anyone he was working on it. Now this, this failure was very public. So he was about to give up in 1994 when, when he had a kind of brainwave. And, um, There was a method that he was using that didn't quite work. But prior to that, there was another method which he tried. And um, decided it wasn't satisfactory. But suddenly he had this brainwave. What if I combine these two? Each one by themselves is insufficient. But together, they work. So, it was quite a dramatic moment for him. Let me just see. He says, it was a moment of inspiration that Wiles will never forget. As he recounted these moments, the memory was so powerful that he was moved to tears it was so indescribably beautiful. It was so simple and so elegant. I couldn't understand how I'd missed it. And I just stared at it in disbelief for 20 minutes. Then during the day, I walked around the department and I'd keep coming back to my desk, looking to see if it was still there. It was still there. I couldn't contain myself. I was so excited. It was the most important moment of my working life. Nothing I ever do again will mean as much. So he had actually proved that Fermat was correct. He, uh, he's received quite a few honors. He's now Sir Andrew Wiles. He got knighted. Um, he's a Regius Professor of Mathematics at Oxford University. Um, he got the Wolfscale Prize. But of course, it wasn't worth that much because the Deutsche Mark had been devalued. Um, but he got it. Um, he also got quite a few other prizes. There's a, there's a thing in mathematics. There's no Nobel Prize in mathematics, but there's a thing called the Fields Medal, which he actually didn't get because you have to be under 40. And he was 41. So. But he, he, did, he did very well. Uh, if you're interested, there's a BBC Horizon program called Fermat's Enigma, which you know you can probably get on YouTube. Um, there's also this book by a man called Simon Singh, which is quite interesting. It gives you all the history. Let me finish with um, with Wiles again. I think this comes from the BBC Horizon program. He said, I had this very rare privilege of being able to pursue in my adult life what had been my childhood dream. I know it's a rare privilege, but if you can tackle something in adult life that means that much to you, then it's more rewarding than anything imaginable. Having solved this problem, there's certainly a sense of loss. But at the same time, there is this tremendous sense of freedom. I was so obsessed by this problem that for eight years I was thinking about it all the time. When I woke up in the morning to when I went to sleep at night. 
That's a long time to think about one thing. That particular odyssey is now over. My mind is at rest. I guess one final thought. Um, did Fermat really have a proof? Probably not. Certainly wouldn't have had Wiles' proof. Um, he may have thought he did. He may have been able to prove, you know, for, for three or four, and then be able to extend that. But he was right, all the same. Thank you very much.